to another episode of Search It Up with Sienna, the web series where I use IMDb to discover and talk about all different types of movies and TV shows, and how the people in front of and behind the camera not only make it all possible, but are somehow all interconnected. And to start off the new year, I'm going to be talking about an amazing and inspirational movie, Rudy. And I am honored to have the director of Rudy, David Anspot, joining me for a two-part episode. Rudy is such a timeless and uplifting movie based on the true story of Daniel Rudiger, a diehard Notre Dame fan who, despite everybody telling him that he'll never get into Notre Dame, he'll never play on their legendary football team, his dream, he proves them wrong. The movie stars Sean Astin as Rudy, and it's worth watching over and over and over again. And now I would like to welcome my special guest today, director David Anspaugh, who's worked on so many classic movies and TV shows, including Hill Street Blues, Miami Vice, and St. Elsewhere. His first movie, Hoosiers, was an award-winning movie, and he also directed Fresh Horses, Moonlight and Valentino, Wise Girls, and Little Red Wagon, and of course, Rudy. Now, without further ado, here's my interview with David Anspa. How did you get started directing, and can you talk about some of your early experiences? So I grew up in a small little town. We had one little theater, and uh, <laughs> when I was really young, I used to think that's where they made the movies. <laughs> you know, literally, that, that somewhere behind a curtain, they made all these films, and then they would project them. In any case, it was always a dream of mine. I, I would go to the studio with when my mom would go pick up my dad at night, and my sister and I would go into the camera room, and I would loosen the tripod and pretend that it was a movie camera, and I would direct my sister to do stuff, you know, we would make up little plays and things. That led to, when I was in college, I had uh, an eight millimeter camera. I started making small moments. And I, quite frankly, I didn't have the grades to get in film school. But oddly enough, I went to a conference one, uh, one summer in Aspen, the Aspen Institute, and one of the speakers was James Earl Jones. Now, there's another name that connects with your, you know, Darth Vader, Field right? Of, uh -huh. And Field of Dreams. And also, the weird thing is, I was in, in, we were in teepees. And I was in James' little group. And afterwards, um, I said, hey, I know this is weird, but do you want to, just time to get some coffee or whatever? He said, oh, I'd love to. But he said, I came here to catch trout. I'm going trout fishing, right? but it was really nice to meet you. So he went off trout fishing. Now I worked at a restaurant and when the door opened at five o'clock, James Earl was standing right out front. I said, my God, Mr. Jill, what are you doing here? He goes, I didn't catch a damn thing. I, I said, you're the one place that serves fresh trout. So he said, I'm coming here to have dinner. So we got in a conversation and the weird thing is, it, it's, uh, I could write a book about it. Um, it was during that time in Aspen that I started dating a girl for a very short time who worked for Jack Nicholson and she invited me to Spain and he was shooting a movie there. We became good friends. Uh, he then came to Aspen over Christmas while he was shooting Chinatown with Roman Polanski and a whole bunch of people. And uh, the last night, because I helped him set up with ski lessons and, and houses and all that. I was teaching skiing as well and all that. So how much do I owe you for all this? And I said, you don't owe me anything. But I said, there is one thing I could ask. I said, I've always wanted to go to USC and maybe if you could write a letter of recommendation for me, it might help me get in. I have that two page handwritten letter in my house that Jack wrote for me that got me into USC. Um, and he actually was going to play the coach in Hoosiers before Gene Hackman, but that's how I ended up out there. And a friend of mine that I met through my first wife, um, he was a script writer and he met Stephen Bochco 
Stephen Bochco was doing three projects at once. He needed an associate producer. So he hired Greg and he hired me as an associate producer. And the first show we did was a show called Paris with James Earl Jones. That's the lead character, right? So he and I just kept, you know, stumbling into each other. And uh, the show was canceled after 13 episodes. It was on CBS. And uh, we were getting ready to pack up and, and leave and go look for another job when Bochco came back one afternoon after lunch. He said, everybody, take your girlfriend, your boyfriend, whatever, and come back in two weeks. We're going to write another cop show. And that became Hill Street Blues. Mm -hmm. And when Hill Street looked like it was going to be canceled after the first year because we weren't getting a big, they kept moving us around. And back then, you couldn't record shows. You know, people literally, they built their yeah. evenings on what was on the air. So, um, but we ended up sweeping the Emmys that year. And so they ordered more shows for the next year. And I convinced Bochco, I said, if we ever get picked up for a second season, because nobody thought we would. I said, if we get picked up for second season, would you give me a shot at directing? He said, well, look, you do a great job as a, as a producer on the show and all the post-production, and you don't have any film to show me, do you? I mean, do you have something I could see? I went, no, but I, I'm pretty sure I can do this. I've been studying acting um, for a few years now um, since I went to USC because why? Not because I want to be an actor, but because I thought if I ever was going to direct anything one day, I was sure every actor, every director knew how to communicate with actors. Uh, that was pretty naive because later I found out that very, very few did. Um, so he finally, they picked us up and he gave me that show to direct. Now he said, if you mess this up, it's the only chance you're going to get. And I said, okay, fair enough. And that first show that I directed uh, was nominated for a Director's Guild Award for Best <laughs> Drama. So that paid off pretty nicely. <laughs> and, the night that, and the night that I celebrated when, when I finished the show, I took my wife out for dinner at this restaurant and who comes and sits at the next table? Not James Earl Jones, Jack Nicholson and Angelica Houston. And I hadn't seen Jack in a while and he goes, he gives everybody a nickname. Mine was Spa. Short for Ann Spa, he goes, Spa, what are you doing here? I said, well, you're going to love this, Jack. The reason I'm here with my wife. And I told him about directing my first show. And I mean, he was grinning from ear to ear. And so based on that, Bochco gave me a second show to do that second season. And that show got nominated and I won the Director's Guild Award for that, right? So I was off and running. But I was lucky because I got, I'm sure you've seen all this. I directed Miami Vice and, and, and a lot of St. Elsewhere's and, and things like that. But, uh, but Hoosiers was my first feature film. And uh, that I'm more proud of than probably anything I've done, I think. Rudy was more fun. I, of all the things I've ever done, pilots, commercials, series, whatever, uh, features, Rudy was by far the most fun I've ever had making movies. Mm -hmm. And can you talk about your experience directing Rudy? Um, when, what went into um, the process from pre-production to principal photography to post-production? You know, you ask these questions, they sound so simple, but <laughs> the answers are so long. There's a book called The Making of Hoosiers and The Making of Rudy, if you're ever interested. Uh, let me put it this way. The only time a movie had ever been made at Notre Dame was in 1950 with Ronald Reagan. And it was called Newt Rockne, All-American. And Newt Rockne was a very, very famous coach at, at Notre Dame. So for years and years and years, decades went by and everybody wanted, you know, they would get dozens of requests every year to make movies at Notre Dame and they wouldn't allow it. And Rudy came into our lives. We wanted to tell the story. And um, we finally were summoned to, they call it the Golden Dome, where the, where the, uh, where, uh, the Father Beauchamp, the president, his office was. And we knew that we were going to be told whether or not 
we were going to be allowed to or not. It was me, myself, and the real Rudy. And we stopped on the steps before we went in and we said, look, if they turn us down, which they probably will, let's just agree we're not going to make this movie because we didn't, there was no money in this. There was no, if, there was CGI, but it was so expensive at the time, right? And there's no other place that's like Notre Dame. So we had just agreed, okay, if they say yes, super. If they don't, we're not going to do it. And we went up and they gave us all the reasons why over 50 years they had not allowed anybody to make a movie. But they said, we, we're going to say yes to you. Wow. And the reason they said yes was because, A, they didn't think it was, and they were right, that it wasn't a football movie. It was about other things. And that's why when we heard Rudy's story, we said, this is a story that not only can we relate to, but millions of other people male, female, sports fans, non-sports fans, it doesn't matter. Because, you know, I was lucky. I had parents that were supportive of me, but they had to undergo some of that humiliation, people laughing behind your back and all. But, you know, I know you're aware of it. I mean, kids are told if they're not lucky enough, you're not smart enough, you're not pretty enough, you're not athletic enough, you're not whatever enough. So forget that dream, just let it go. It's not gonna happen. So we were, we were, we were quite, I mean, we were in shock and they said it wasn't a football movie. And here's the, here's the other thing. The president of the university, Dr. Bo, uh, Father Bochamp, he had been invited to a dinner party that weekend before our meeting. And he said at the dinner party, we all were going to watch a movie after the dinner. And the movie happened to be Hoosiers. Wow. <laughs> By total coincidence, he had no idea. Nobody knew anything about Rudy or the meeting or anything. And he said, that was the other reason I said yes. Mm -hmm. That's so interesting. And um, the scoring of Rudy is just amazing. And the music is just so good. How involved were you in, the, in Rudy's music? Well, it's funny you bring that up. Um, and while I, before I answer that, I just take the time to to compliment you on your eclectic taste of film and, and your, your wonderful ability to do your homework and, and your questions are really good and to the point. And the great thing about um, uh, Jerry Goldsmith, of course, composed the music to Hoosiers and Rudy, and for people who don't know, Jerry Goldsmith, uh, who passed away, I don't know, seven, eight, God, it could be 10 years, I don't know. Uh, at the time, he had, he had a number of Academy Awards. He'd been nominated for like 16 or 17 Academy Awards. And um, we, I won't even go into the story, but how we got it, because we had no money for a composer. But we knew somebody that knew him and they snuck him into a screening room to see this movie. All we did, we just watched him. We didn't look at the screen. We just wanted to see if we could read his body language, how he was reacting. And he didn't move a muscle. And when the movie was over, he just stood, he just sat there. And I went, I said, oh, I think he's waiting for us to leave because he's too embarrassed <laughs> that we're here. He doesn't want to say something he didn't mean or whatever. And as it turned out, he got up and his eyes were all red and swollen. And he'd been sitting there crying you know, through the movie, he said, I have to do this film. And working, we, we traveled to, again, we didn't have much money, so we tra traveled to um, Budapest, Hungary, and we used the Budapest State Opera Orchestra to do the score for the film. And after that was over, uh, he, he said, I'll do anything you guys, if you, you two guys do another movie, I'm on board. I don't care what it's about. I want to work with you guys. He was a joy to work with. Now, I thought working with Jerry Goldsmith, now I had some notes, not many, but I had some notes, but I thought, who am I to say to a 16-time <laughs> Academy Award you know, composer, considered one of the best ever in the world, um, I'm David Anspaugh, I have a couple of notes <laughs> on your score, but when I finally got up enough courage to talk to him about it, he he welcomed it and he encouraged it. And he, he said, I don't, don't ever think about how silly it might sound or whatever. I want to be inside your brain. I want to know what you think. And, and he was amazing. We actually, I gave him some ideas here and there. 
and he would tweak them and make them sound magnificent. And he was a, he was a joy to work with. And he uh, he should have received an Oscar. He was nominated for for Hoosiers, mm -hmm. and he didn't win. He should have been nominated for Rudy, because at one time, not that long ago, um, you know what trailers are, obviously, right? Well. When you're, when you're putting a trailer together, a lot of times you don't have the music composed for your movie, right? Mm -hmm. So they do a temp dub, a temp track for, for the trailer. They'll steal music from anywhere, anywhere from Star Wars to Rocky, yeah, whatever. Yeah. But at one point in time, the, the score to Rudy was used by more movies for the trailers of their film than any that, had ever been, that has ever been done before. Wow. Television uses it a lot. Uh, commercials use it. It's it's pretty amazing. He deserved at least a nomination for that one. But he was so approachable, you know. I mean, somebody who's just so knowledgeable and 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 a good and one of the very good people in the business. One of the best persons I ever worked with personally. Uh, he actually became a very close friend, and I miss him a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, but. Uh, it was, um, yeah, my experience was quite, I was quite, I've been very fortunate. I've worked with other really wonderful composers as well. And I've been very lucky. I've never had a bad experience with anybody, you know, but they all work differently. But Jerry was special. He, unlike anyone else I'd ever worked with, he immediately, something spoke to him from the material that allowed him to translate that to music that, the likes of which I've never really seen. Some people would get there, they would work maybe longer or hard of it. With Jerry, it just, man, it was magic watching him. Yeah. Just like that. What I love about the music is how it sort of fits into what you, almost the music's kind of the character. It's almost like you're going inside the character's head, but like through is, instrumental music. In, in every film, I mean, score is, if it's properly done, you're absolutely right. It is a character. Yes, definitely. And um, was the movie all filmed in Indiana um, and at Notre Dame? Uh, yes. Yes, it was, except um, where he grew up in the early, in this early scenes with him playing football and at the mill where they had the big explosion. Mm -hmm. uh, that was shot I mean, it was practically in Indiana. It was just outside of Chicago. It was almost an Indiana-Chicago border. Um, so, and that was another thing. It was our second film. And, you know, we, that was two back-to-back -back that we had done in the state of Indiana. And uh, that was great. I, I, like I said, to have the campus of Notre Dame, when I would get up every morning, I'm staying at my hotel, but when I would get up, you talk about you mentioned pre-production earlier. I've never had more fun. I get up in South Bend, Indiana. I drive to the campus, campus of Notre Dame, which is one of the most beautiful schools around. Our production office was right in the middle of campus, right beside a lake. And it was like everything just kind of fell into place. Yeah. Our, my production designer had a term for it. And he said, uh, he said there's something about this movie when things look like they might be going wrong, they didn't. Everything worked out right. And he said, we're in the God loop. That's what he would call it. We're in the God loop. And the best example of that is, you know the shot where Sean is trying to get into the football game and trying to buy a ticket from somebody? Mm -hmm. and, and, the, and the shot starts with him and it goes up and up and up and you see him and there's like, maybe two people that he tries to hit up and they don't have tickets. And just the camera just gets to the top over the lip and the crowd roars because Notre Dame had scored. And Sean stopped where he was and looked over like, oh my God, I wish I could be in there. I got it all in one shot. That was not planned. That was not rehearsed. As my production designer said, you were in the God loop. He said you couldn't plan that in a million years. <laughs> and, and that was it. It was one shot. We didn't do any, any other versions of it. Wow, that's amazing. And as a director, how do you bring so many um, different things, like the performances and the music and the sets together to tell the story 
for a movie like Rudy, how do you even tackle that process? It's kind of easy. It's 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 like it's like what uh, President-elect Biden is doing now, and what every really good president does. And I remember being young. I remember when John Kennedy did it. You get the very best people to work with you to surround you, mm -hmm. and 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 that you don't. Um, I've seen it as a producer on television. I've seen it as a director. I've seen it happen with people that I knew and didn't know, and especially when they start directing. Uh, and I told my kids in my directing class, I said, please don't go there and figure that you have to have all, that you have all the answers because you don't. You may think you do, but you don't. And if you've done your job properly, you've, you've put together a community of artists that all have great minds and you've got to keep your ears open. Ultimately, you're responsible for what choices you make, of course. And that, that's being like the captain of a ship. You know, I mean, you've got hopefully the best mates on board and, and everybody's going to do their job. But ultimately, you're the one that steers the course and you tell them which way to go, whether it works or it doesn't work. And, you know, I've had that happen too. But it was, uh, it, it's, it's a matter of really doing your homework. And for me, and I told these young uh would be directors and um, I even schooled them to a certain degree in it. Uh, we had sort of kind of acting classes that I tried to expose them to it because none of them had ever acted before. And I said, if you're ever going to direct movies, if you're going to do with actors, I said, this is something that you have to do. You have to find a place where you can begin to learn what, there are so many different processes and so many, you know, it's gonna take time, but it is worth it. It's a hundred, your, your work will be so much better than anyone else's, you know? And it just, it's fostering those things and just keeping your eyes and ears open like you do when you, when you go to movies. And, and you know, you, you jot down those things that you like and, and seek out those people. And in most cases, I was lucky to get those people. Yeah, definitely. And in the scenes where um, you see like all the football players playing at Notre Dame, and then you see like um, the, all this, all of these audience members, and there's so many people watching. Are those all extras, or did you actually use footage from real games? Well, that's a really interesting question that you asked. Um, it's interesting because um, do you know who Dennis Hopper is, the actor? I definitely sounds familiar. In Hoosiers, he played the assistant coach, the drunk. Yeah. Dennis Hopper was one of the great filmmakers and actors uh, of the 60s, 70s, were iconic. Um, uh, he would, you, as you get older, you'll see more of his films. And uh, I showed Dennis my director's cut of Rudy. The first question he asked, he turned around and he goes, how did you get Notre Dame to give you all that game footage? <laughs> I said, well, they didn't. He said, what do you mean? I said, we shot all that. And he goes, no, you can't be a BS or I know that that's, I said, every foot of it, Dennis, we shot. And um, he was mightily impressed. We didn't have the money. I could, we could, today we could have gone to a high school somewhere and we could have creatively through special effects and CGI, we could have built Notre Dame Stadium around that visually and all the crowds would be fake. I shot it, I shot all my money shots, meaning I had to get Rudy coming out of the tunnel with real crowd. Oh, that was the other thing. We went to the athletic department and we said, we really need some time at the halftime of one of your games. And they said, well, it's fine by us, but you don't have to ask us. You have to ask the band because that's their time. So we had to go to the band and ask them if we could have 15 minutes, you know, which is basically most of their time or almost, it's more than half of the time. And we arranged it for one game and they were playing Boston College. So I knew the shots that I needed. I needed Rudy coming out of the tunnel with real people. I needed him standing on the sidelines with real people. I had a shot of him running into the game. 
real people, him running down on the kickoff, him making the tackle and being carried off the field. Now those shots were all done with a full stadium. Now we, it's funny because most people who were there were going, you know, instead of going to get a hot dog or getting a beer or whatever, Boston College went off the field, Notre Dame went on the, off the field, and then all of a sudden, here comes Georgia Tech and some version of a Notre Dame team. Like, everybody's going, what is going on? Everybody just stood there. Why? Because the microphone went out. So we couldn't explain to the crowd what we were doing. Right? Oh, wow. Well, they're just going, what is going on? Well, they finally figured out. I mean, you know, they saw cameras and stuff. Well, they're shooting something. And, you know, I was freaking out because if the crowd doesn't know what we're doing, you know, how are we going to get them to chant Rudy and all that stuff? Well, the students knew what we were doing, right? And the cheering section knew what we were doing. And so just like on the real day, on cue, I had our players, the football players on the sideline, starting to chant Rudy. And then the student body in the cheering section started. And then it started spreading around the whole stadium. And I've already I've met people to this day that were there who said, I was there. I wondered why everybody was yelling Rudy, but I just joined in. I had no idea it was part of a movie. And so it actually kind of happened like it really did yeah. happen. So it was pretty exciting. and and. The great thing about it, we got all those shots turned out to be perfect. And then most of the game footage we shot with about maybe 300, 400 extras. And we had really long lenses, you know, so that it didn't give away the fact we could shoot the big wide shots and we cut to the smaller stuff where we had people, you know, squeezed into those frames. So in the end, I was immensely proud of what we did because it looked like it was actual game footage. Wow. Know. What was the most challenging scene to film? Uh, it, there, there are, two, there are two, two scenes. Technically, by far, that was one of the biggest challenges of all time. We were shooting on the, on the practice field, those scenes. We would go to this other field and we would really rehearse all those scenes, the, like I call them the big, the money scenes with Sean in front of a crowd. We re rehearsed it like a ballet. I mean, literally, we had stopwatches and wait, people had to do this and then they had to go to that formation. They had to go that, it was literally choreographed like a Bob Fosse dance, seriously. And they, and they did it to perfection because we did it all in something like 12 minutes. We got all this, yeah, I know, I know. It's, it's, I, when I think about it now, it's like unbelievable. That was the toughest technical one. The, the other one was Sean reading the letter where he got accepted into Notre Dame. Hmm. There comes a day or a time where something, it just isn't working. And a lot of times it happens when it's a really important scene and an actor has a lot of time to think about, oh, I got to really be on it that day because that's when I read the letter and I kind of don't, break down and cry, but I'm very emotional and, and I'm full of emotion. Now I'm going to run off to tell my family. So there was a lot on his shoulders and, and getting that done properly was very hard. Um, Sean was very hard. And, um, I, I tried all the tricks that I knew in the book and finally it came down to one thing and, uh, and Sean tells this, I, talked about it in interviews he said I couldn't get there for David I was so frustrated and finally he said David looked at me right in the eye and, he, and David said to me what are you afraid of I remember saying that to him and I didn't know what it what was going to happen but he went roll the camera right now just start start rolling and he said when you said what are you afraid of it triggered something in me emotionally that I knew exactly how to do that moment. Now, I can't tell you what it triggered within him, huh. but part of that is, is, again, came from my training and working with actors. And sometimes it's instinctual where, where it comes from. But those were two, two, of the, uh, two things I'm most proud of in that movie. I hope you're enjoying my chat with David Anspaugh so far. 
We discuss so much more in part two of my interview with him. So be sure to tune in. See you next time.